African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, education, and philanthropy. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they'd been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr. Joining us on today's program is Ruth Clark, founder and president of the Support Network, an organization of professional African American women that provides a number of services to our community. Ruth, would you tell us how the Support Network under your leadership got started? Well, actually, you know, a number of women came to me and said that they want to form a new organization and something very different other than the uh, other organizations that were out there. And at the time, I said, no, I can't do this because I was so involved in my business. And then they kept pursuing me, and eventually they broke down my resistance. And I'm glad that they did, and we started the support network. And we were kind of floundering for a year or so, didn't know exactly what we wanted to do, but we knew we wanted to do something for the community. And eventually, we decided to be a fundraising organization, and we would take on certain projects in the, the, the black community. And um, we started with Harlem Hospital. First, we used to be a part of the March of Dimes. Mm -hmm. And they brought the idea of the neonatal intensive care unit to us. And we thought, this is a wonderful idea because there's no one else in the country doing this. So we adopted the neonatal intensive care unit. And for 15 years, we have been raising money at our spectacular New Year's Eve party for the neonatal intensive care unit. I would say about $650,000 we've mm -hmm. given them in equipment. That's really fantastic. First of all, it shows a lot of leadership on your part and of these other African-American women. Uh, I gather some of them are professionals, some of them are government, some of them are business. Yes, many of them. Uh, we have Harriet Michelle, who's a leader in this country, a minority business. We have investment bankers, um, Irene Elmore, who is the co-founder of the Support Network. We have doctors, a geriatric doctor, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. we Soon we might need her, her assistance. And we have a number of professional women mm -hmm. in different walks of life, which makes it great. This is part of what uh, some of us see as a trend in the African-American community. For those who have made it to give back to the community from which they came. It's so essential because no one makes it on their own. And... Uh, if you don't give back to your community, there's no insurance that you can, as far as I'm concerned, that you can continue. I think it's very important that we must give back because no one achieves on their own. We have to give back to our communities. Now, you use the term support network. It's, it's very good words. Supporting the community and the networking that goes on between the women in the network. That's right. Now, tell us some of the things that happens as a result of that in terms of their business, their professional and personal lives. Well, in many aspects on trips and different things, or if we have a personal problem, we rally together to protect our, our individual members. And um, it's a great group. I tell you, it took a while before the group really became a group that understood what we were doing and that it was not only about a party. It was have a great time, but remember, this is a very serious cause. It took a, little, a while for us to understand that. But now we're there. We really are there, and I'm really proud of how far we have come. In fact, I'm really proud of the fact that this New Year's Eve, we're buying a state-of-the-art ventilator for Harlem Hospital, which can you believe in this day and age that they did not have the state-of-the-art uh, uh, ventilator? Mm -hmm. So that was an ambitious uh, uh, decision, but we raised some of the money right there that night. In 20 minutes, we raised about $20,000 to well, buy that uh, ventilator. Well, it says something about you and says something about the network and says something about the people who relate to it. Because you've done other kinds of fundraisers, you've done boat rides and receptions and so on, and you bring together people who want to help the community, Absolutely. and at the same time want to interact with each other. Right. That's, that's the networking part right. of it. Well, there's some, a lot of great things that have happened. People have gotten uh, positions from being at the network. People have met their husbands and their wives at the network. So we've done a, we've done a lot of great work. And there are two things that we do, two major fundraisers we have a year. One is for uh, the neonatal intensive care unit. And the second one is for our minority scholarship, scholarship fund that we fund about 15 to 18 kids to go to independent schools. Mm -hmm. And these kids we took on about five or six years old. They were at the time, and now some of them are 11, 12, and 13. It's just amazing to see how they grow up. And because of this work that we have done for them, these 16 kids will give back to their community because that's the way they were raised. 
raised and they will feel that's what they have to do. So I'd be very curious to see them as adults. I know they'll be outstanding adults. See, this is part of the tradition in the African-American community of reaching out and helping. Of course, given where we came from slavery and in the days of uh, segregation, we had to help each other. And Absolutely. Unfortunately, some of our younger people haven't had that tradition. You and I had it in our families. Before, at Christmas time, before I could get gifts, I had to give gifts That's to right. people who were less fortunate. And all of us did things like that. Now, is there much conversation other than just organizational about what we as African Americans need to do for our community in terms of helping our community? What are some of those conversations? Well, com some of the conversations we do feel, I think more and more, I'm really proud to see where, where we came from, where we're going, that more and more of us realize we have to give back to our community. But then many of us have given our children too much. Mm -hmm. We seem to have made it through the struggle and, and, and have done very well. Mm -hmm. And I think they need to know a little bit more about the struggle mm -hmm. and that things just don't, don't come very easily. They have to work for it. Mm -hmm. I remember when my nephew was like nine or 10 years old, he wanted to work because that was instilled in him. And so he started working at nine and 10 mm -hmm. years old and have worked and, and enjoyed it. And so I think we have to teach more work ethics to our children if they want something, they have to work for it. And a lot of the problems with the kids today have a lot to do with our, the adults who wanted to kind of shroud them from being going through what we went through. It worked very well for us. So why not them? You hear a lot of that about people who say, well, look, I struggle. Why should my children have to struggle? But as you know from some of the wealthiest people in the country, Rockefellers, for example, they family always insisted that they do something for somebody else. Absolutely. Which helps them to appreciate what they have gotten and helps them to develop a base on which other people can develop. And it's a great feeling from giving. I mean, even through some of my most difficult times of not having, I always thought about someone else who had less than me. Mm -hmm. And so that would be uplifting for me to continue to give because I think you do feel better about it. When you can uh, make someone's life a little better than, mm -hmm. than it was before, it's a great satisfaction. Now let's talk about the networking part in terms of business. You're an entrepreneur and you've gone through the whole tough struggles to become an entrepreneur. That's right. Uh, what are some of the lessons? First of all, tell us about how you got into business. Well, you know what? I always say that entrepreneurs <laughs> are born and then they grow up because you have to have a certain, you have to be very different to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's quite a struggle and I'm definitely a pioneer in what I'm doing. I was the first black woman to head a temporary service on the East Coast, maybe in the whole country in 1974 when I started. And actually I'll be 25 years old this year. 25 years. You mean you in, or the business? Well, me too. <laughs> 25 years in business. 25 straight years uninterrupted. Mm -hmm. And it's by determination and, and wit and the help from my community. Mm -hmm. I've, I did get a lot of help from the community when I first started. And then there was a lot of disappointments too, but I never let them get the best mm -hmm. of me. Now, I always saw a brighter side. Now, wh uh, what advice do you have for your, or what kind of information do you share with your fellow African-American women entrepreneurs. And I'm particularly focusing on African-American women because we know that African-American men are doing some of the same things Absolutely. and are very supportive of the network. But particularly African-American women have two issues to deal with, both the racism and the sexism. Right. So uh, how do other African-American women entrepreneurs work together to help each other? Well, one thing you certainly have to have is integrity. And you cannot, even though there is, uh, racism out here, you just can't, you can't dwell on that. You have to uh, continue to look beyond that because that can take you out also. Mm -hmm. And so I knew there was a lot of racism and many times I would erase that by going into meeting with some of these people who were very racist. Mm -hmm. And when they saw that I could sit down and have an intelligent conversation mm -hmm. with them, they kind of warmed up. So we can't allow that to distract us. We just cannot mm -hmm. allow it to distract us. You must find a way to get around that. What about the networking among each other? Do you do much to help each other in your relative businesses? Oh, definitely, definitely. I um, always felt that if, if I get a small piece of the pie, I want you to have one too. And uh, there's a lot of share, sharing and networking in our organization. And with black women today, we seem to be more helpful to one another. And, and to black men, I, I must say that black men have been very, very helpful mm -hmm. to me. They have been very good friends. Uh, the Suttons were very good. 
They're one of my clients. They support the organization and so many other organizations. Essence has been very good to us in terms of uh, support network. And, I, you know, one day I'd like to look around where we're, we're only supported by our own organizations. Mm -hmm. That would be great. Mm -hmm. And we're moving mm -hmm. closer to it. Now, the other part of building a community is the young people. And mentoring is so much a part of how you bring young people along. Mm -hmm. Does the support network, either formally or informally, do much mentoring? Well, I would think that with the group that we have now, the children that we're working with in the Minority Scholarship Fund, we try to see them three or four times during the year. And I, I'm sure that we are great role models for those mm -hmm. young kids. I mean, they emulate us. Mm -hmm. Well, they've watched us over the years speak, mm -hmm. and now they are part of the program. You've seen them mm -hmm. get, make yeah. these major speeches that blow your mind. And mm -hmm. You don't even want to talk after them. So I think that we are great role models. Uh, in terms of uh, the education part of it, how do you think your contributions filter into the education of those young people? Do you help them with their mathematics, with their reading? I know with their speaking. What kind of things do you do to reach young people? Well, you know, uh, I would say that the children that we have that we, we give tuition assistance are very well spoken. Mm -hmm. I mean, the schools that they go to mm -hmm. and their parents really take a lot of, you can see that these mm -hmm. kids are well bred and are well taken care of. But there are a number of young people that come to my office that really don't know mm -hmm. how to even go on an interview, how to speak well. And we try to counsel them, like most agencies will not do. We try to counsel mm -hmm. them and let them know the reasons why they're not finding work. Mm -hmm. And then we try to send them to other places where they can get the experience and get the training. Because that's very key. I mean, if someone knocks on the door and you can't open it for them without giving them reasons why the door isn't open, I think it's totally unfair. Mm -hmm. Many of them don't know. Many of them don't know that male should wear a tie and a shirt and a jacket if he goes on an interview. Mm -hmm. Many of the women don't know that you don't wear weird hairdos and loads of makeup and uh, many, many skirts to go on an interview. So you have to sit down and talk to them. And it's like selling yourself. Mm -hmm. Many of them don't understand that. That's why the temporary work that I do is so essential because many of them do not have the confidence to convince you that they are the appropriate candidate. So by going in and doing the job, if they have the skills, it's, a, but it's much easier for them to find permanent work that way. That's very interesting. You said some of them don't have the confidence to let you know what they can do. That's right. Many of them don't. Be amazed. How do you find, how do you find out what they can do? Well, we test them all. We talk mm -hmm. to them. We look at their resumes. And one should always have a resume, no matter what skill level you have when you go in for a position. Mm -hmm. And we kind of brief them on what they should be doing and what they're doing. If some things are wrong, we, we allow, tell them, if you, you know, if you want to do better, this is what you should do. Mm -hmm. And it's been very helpful. I like your comment about one should always have a resume. Absolutely. Because I know some very able and accomplished people who say, I don't need a resume. Now, everyone uh, needs Tell one. us why everybody needs a resume and tell us what should be in that resume. Well, what should be in the resume is a highlight of whatever you do, not uh, books on what you do, because mm -hmm. there will be no reason to call you in for mm -hmm. the interview. But you should highlight and format uh, exactly what your experiences mm -hmm. have been over the past years. And just like one small paragraph, as I said, not mm -hmm. more than a paragraph. Mm -hmm. And uh, a resume should not be more than two pages. Mm -hmm. And if you have two pages, you, may, you should have uh, a, a great background. Mm -hmm. It should be a one page to two pages. Mm -hmm. And you leave something there to discuss because if you put everything in the resume, mm -hmm. there's no reason for the person mm -hmm. to call you in to discuss your background. And it should start with your name and your address. And then it should start with the last job, last position you have. And at the end of the resume, it should highlight your skills and the organizations you might be a part of. Mm -hmm. And hopefully you are doing something for the community that you could put, because that's very, mm -hmm. very important and essential. Many uh, corporations uh, and uh, co uh, companies look mm -hmm. for people who have done something for their community or involved. Should a resume, I know some resumes include this, should a resume include your employment objective or your aspiration? Oh, that, that's, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. It should, should certainly have your employment objective. And what you would like to do. Yeah, what you uh, eventually would like to do in right. addition to what you you're have applying done. for right, right now. And you should be as honest as possible because mm -hmm. many of these companies <laughs> are uh, investigating, they have investigative uh, companies that check your background. 
And like for instance, in a uh, an investment firm or a bank, if you lie on your resume, it could you, you could uh, default. Mm -hmm. You could have the gre greatest resume in the world and can do the job, mm -hmm. but if you're not honest, you could lose that on that position mm -hmm. and be blacklisted from that company forever. That's an interesting point. Suppose you have had a little difficulty. Let's say suppose you were fired for cause for being rude or something like that. How do you deal with that? I work with XYZ company, but I left, do you say, because of personal reasons? Or you say, you say personal reasons. Mm -hmm. And you should find out from that company what kind of res uh, mm -hmm. references you will get. Now, mm -hmm. some companies will not give you a reference at all mm -hmm. because they could be sued, uh, because mm -hmm. it, it might be a difference of opinion. So some companies will not give you a re reference at all, which is almost as bad as, uh, not getting, uh, as getting a bad reference because generally if you don't give a reference, mm -hmm. it's because you choose not to and you don't want to say anything negative. So that could be almost as worse as a bad reference. Mm -hmm. That's interesting mm -hmm. because so you say the companies won't do it because they want to be are fearful of being sued. On the other hand, if it's a good employee, it seems to me, you, and they are moving up, so you be want happy to say to. that uh, you're a good employee and this person showed initiative, et cetera. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And another thing these companies are doing today, um, people must be drug tested. Even for some of my temporaries, they are drug tested, criminal background checked, and also credit check. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, it didn't happen five, ten years ago, but today many of my clients, and especially in the investment banking world, will ask for those things. They will uh, give, you, give a credit background check, a criminal check, and also a, a drug test. Now, for instance, I tell my clients, if you're not working, you're going to have credit background problems. Mm -hmm. You're going to have problems. But um, some, some of them insist that they have to have clean credit before they can hire you. And, of course, the reason for that is that they've gotten burned in the past. That's right. For, uh, and then uh, the drug testing, mm -hmm. too. Most companies today, if you're hired on a permanent mm -hmm. basis, you will be drug tested. And you'll also get a criminal background check. Now, it's unfortunate if someone has a record. Now, I get a number of young people that made mistakes, that jumped the turnstile, and did some foolish things. And this will follow them for the rest of their lives. And it's very essential to keep your record clean today. Oh, it's, it's essential in two ways. Keep your record clean and also tell the truth. That's right. For example, as you say, uh, a young person is young and foolish. I, I did this. I'm sorry for it. I paid the penalty for it. But many um, companies will not hire you anyway. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate. It really is very unfortunate, but this is the way it is. And of course, you, your company's on the line because That's right. you refer the, the people. You are the first screen before people go into That's uh, right. the, uh, the place of employment or the employment office. That's true. So your credibility is on the line because if you send people who are not uh, as they say, then they say, well, why do we go to your agency? That's right. And luckily, I tell them, I said, look, whatever you do is your business, and we don't have to know about it. But if you go and take this test, everybody knows. Mm -hmm. So you can tell me you don't want the position, I'll accept it like that. But I don't think you should take the test if you're not, you know, you know you're not going to pass. And don't tell me you, have a, you don't have a criminal background mm -hmm. when it easily will be checked on. Mm -hmm. So some of them will say, I don't want the position, or uh, they'll make up excuses because they don't really want me to know they take drugs. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, we try to send people that are drug-free mm -hmm. to work. I'm sure you do. Do you think that the, the drug problem in the African American community is uh, diminished as compared to 10 years ago? Oh yes, mm -hmm. oh definitely. It has diminished quite a bit because it's it's uh, precluding you from going on with your work. Mm -hmm. I mean, many people mm -hmm. will not get jobs today, and they realize it now. These young people realize that at any given day they could be drug tested. Mm -hmm. So many of them, if they did it, they have stopped, which is good which is excellent in many. So it's nothing like it was years ago when I first started that you didn't know what you would get and uh, you really had to be good at, at judging people to see if they were on drugs or not. Has uh, the employment community um, reduced some of their discrimination against people who are HIV? Well, that is definitely, you cannot not hire someone. And I've hired mm -hmm. a number of people mm -hmm. uh, at my organization who have H mm -hmm. HIV and AIDS. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I have had so many to pass on, so mm-hmm. many, that I'm almost numb from it. Well, I believe you have participated in the Black Leadership Commission on AIDS That's functions right. from time to time. Oh, my goodness. And the purpose of that is to educate people about the fact that HIV can be dealt with and is not something that's communicable, is not something that should that's keep right. people Absolutely. out of the workforce. And as you say, it currently, at least in New York State, is illegal. Not well, you know, Roscoe, about, let me see, about eight years ago, I was on this commission with Koch. That's when I learned about AIDS and how they said that we were going to lose 40 percent of black women. I mean, it just blew my mind when I read those statistics years ago. And as time went on, I see this is coming to, uh, to, to, into fruition. It's, it really is uh, mind boggling what has happened. And it has really affected blacks more than any other race. Um, it's absolutely frightening. I've dealt with so many of them. Many of them, what happens, you just know the attitude. After a while, they get angry, and some of them leave, and they go to another state. But many of them have called me and told me that they had it, and they were in the hospital, and they were in the lab. Could I say a kind word? And I said, you might be going to a better place. Mm-hmm. So, you know, um, if you can't do anything about it, just relax. And, of course, with the new drugs, it's possible to live and today, for long a, periods of time that's with right, HIV. That's right. Mm-hmm. And we, we, we just heard on the news today mm-hmm. that there might be a cure. Mm-hmm. for AIDS. Well, we certainly hope so. I eventually, hope so. Eventually, sure. <laughs> in most of these conditions, we find some way of, of curing, and some of them are lifestyle. For example, AIDS came from unsafe sex and intravenous drug use. Right. And but some people get it very those are, Those are, are lifestyle situations that can be dealt with. That's right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now, with the support network, you've done the work at Harlem with the neonatal center, and that's something you can really be proud of in Harlem Hospital. Well, the doctor said it's the most important work that we've ever done in our lives because we essentially have saved thousands of babies, Mm -hmm. and these children will grow up to be productive Mm -hmm. uh, productive, uh, adults. So it really is very important work that we do. Of course, you say they'll grow up to be productive adults. What you really mean, if we do the right things, they will grow up. Now, what are some of those other things? Do you do anything as a support network? Uh, support any of the foster care programs or things like that at this point in time? Uh, no, you know what we really would like to get into, Roscoe? I would like to see us get in- involved in daycare for women that are struggling to take go to work mm-hmm. and really cannot afford the daycare mm-hmm. centers. I think that that's what we should try to mm-hmm. attack mm-hmm. Uh, eventually, to raise money specifically for that area so these women can feel independent, mm-hmm. go to work and feel that their children are in the appropriate places and not be really stifled in terms of not having enough income. That's what I'd really like to see us do. See, one of the problems with welfare reform and workfare is that child care That's inhibits right. some people Absolutely. from taking the jobs that they would be able to take or would be qualified to take. Absolutely. So the, the one initiative that the support network might undertake is this child care initiative. Yeah, that's what we, yeah. I, th- I think we'd like to do eventually. It, but of course, we'd have to raise a lot more money but um, as you know, that's very mm-hmm. costly. It costs some of these women $150, $200 a week, which is sometimes what they net. Mm-hmm. So it's almost impossible. So we would like to fund, I, I think eventually we'd like to get in, look into funding some of these women on these welfare to work programs. Now you've been so good in the support network, so successful at raising money. What are some of the keys to raising money? Uh, from the African-American community, from any community. What are the keys to fundraising? You're successful. So we say, what makes you successful other than your commitment, which obviously is clear? Well, it's got to be a good cause, and people have to believe that that's where the money is going. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and I think people know that we, we have done that and beyond. And plus, you have to have a good gift of gab mm-hmm. to convince people. And then the, the events that we give... Uh, they're, they're wonderful, and mm-hmm. we give a lot back to our community. And I, we, we always want to keep our individuals because they were the first to start the event because if we didn't have them, mm-hmm. we wouldn't have been able to get to the corporations. Because y- your group, in a sense, made personal contribution to get this started That's initially. Right. Well, you know how we really got started? If you really want to know the truth, Gus Jenkins of the Black Sports and Tennis Foundation, when Arthur Ashe was alive, um, he, I went to him to, when we went. When we first started the organization, and I tried to raise the money within the within the group. It was a different group of women then, and no one wanted to come out of pocket. And I felt that it wasn't fair for me to fund the whole thing. Mm-hmm. So I went to him, and he gave us I think about five thousand dollars to get started. We've never looked back. Mm-hmm. And if he was like an investor, he would have made his money back a mm-hmm. hundred times. And that's how we got started. And first, because the first three few years 
we used to fund the Black Tennis and, and, and Sports Foundation. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gus Jenkins is really our savior. Now, of course, you're developing some of the secrets of fundraising. One of them clearly is networking, which is what oh, you yes. call yourself. The other is event planning. That's right. Uh, the other is to have a clear mission. That's right. And I guess the final thing is uh, uh, recruitment and, and, and salesmanship. That's you right. have recruited literally dozens of people to work with you. That's true. That's true. You know, in the beginning, I was the only one bringing corporate support. And I used to tell them, you know, one day I'll look at this list and I'll see at least 10 of us bringing in corporate support. And now today, it's just wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, all, and I, and I, every week, I tell, every month, I tell these women, there is someone that you know in a corporation that will be very happy to, to work with mm -hmm. you. And, and they used to say, no, we don't know anyone. And eventually, they realized they did have a finger on someone in the corporation that would support our cause. And now it's a number of us bringing corporate support, and it's wonderful. It basically, it's a can-do attitude. That's right. It's something that says people from our community, African-American community, have something to offer. Either we offer it ourselves, or we get our friends, or we get the people we work with, or we get the corporations. So it is really a can-do attitude. That's right. And this, the, the, how similar is this to church fundraising? Is it, uh, I know church fundraising isn't quite so corporate, but uh, how do you parallel those uh, activities, church fundraising, religious fundraising, as against the support network type thing? Well, I would say that we all do great work. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> we all do great work. And, of course, in some ways, you use some of the same techniques in Absolutely. terms of the networking. Motivating and the people, making motivating them want people. to give. Uh, and, you, you know, we looked at our numbers and realized we give as much as some of these big organizations. Mm -hmm. We give back at least forty to $50,000 a year. Whatever we make, we give back into the community. Mm -hmm. We just keep enough for our expenses, and we give it right back to the community. Because I didn't want to be a part of a group that had a major bank account and the community is out there suffering. That didn't make sense to me. Well, that's why Ruth Clark is a leader. That's why Ruth Clark founded a support network, and that's why the support network is important and makes significant contributions to the African-American community. Thanks for being with us today. Well, thank you, Roscoe. Yeah.